Good morning and welcome to what I hope will be an interesting and informative discussion about ANPR in the context of the new parking code of practice. Firstly, I'd like to thank Landor Links and ZatPark for organizing this webinar. We are grateful for the ongoing support in enabling us to host these meetings, which I'm sure you agree are more convenient and cost effective. For those who don't know me, I'm Wes Libba, Head of Customer Experience at Unity5. Unity5 being the company developed the market leading parking management software, ZPark. ZPark provide a range of software solution products in the parking industry, from processing through to permits, through to process and payments. Today's discussion is about AMPR in the context of new parking, of the new parking code of practice. Um, a little bit more about AMPR. So AMPR, which stands for Automatic Number Plate Recognition Technology, is a powerful payment management tool offering frictionless payment transactions on the basis of virtual permit schemes. AMPR can be used to confirm a link between a vehicle using a car park and the payments made for that visit or parking per permit. Um, number plate rec uh, reading systems are also widely used to ensure compliance with terms and conditions of privately owned car parks, with approved operators being able to apply to the DVLA <clears throat> for vehicle keeper, deta keeper details to ensure non-compliant drivers pay for the charges that are due. As many of you are aware, the government are developing and introducing a new parking code of practice for parking on private land, which forms part of a raft of changes uh, to the way which the private land is administered, the structuring of parking charges, notices, and how appeals by motorists against PCNs are made. Um, in today's discussion, um, there are two key themes in today's webinar, which include uh, connecting ANPR to payment channels and looking at ANPR as a whole process encompassing the type and location of cameras the management and planning of the car park, signature and the back office, for example, how the data collected by the system is managed. To help us delve deeper into AMPR, we have a star-studded panel and they are James Hampton, uh, onboarding and implementation senior specialist at Unity5. We also have Peter Dowling, head of systems and infrastructure, uh, base entry solutions, Nick Hansel, director of Watching UK, Steve Walker, who's Managing Director and Joint Founder of MAV Systems, and Lawson Noble, Chief Technical Officer of Vector, uh, Vector uh, Recognition Systems. The panel will be taking questions once all the presentations have been done. So please post any questions you have in the Q&A box. We'll hope to get through all your questions today, but I'm sure that um, the panelists will be happy for you to get in contact with them directly after the events if we don't get to get to your question. Uh, to avoid any, to avoid your questions being missed, please uh, can I stress that you post your questions in the Q and A box and not the chat box. Uh, so, without any further ado, I'd like to welcome our first panelist. He is James Hampton, onboarding and implementation senior specialist at Unity Five. He's a diamond with having successfully won onboarding fifty new parking operators onto Zach Park. Being relatively new to the parking industry, James is a continuous is on a continuous path to learning and applying everything there is to know about parking. A key fact about James is that he has presented England at Lawn Bowls. So there's an interesting fact. James, over to you. Thanks very much, Wes. Uh, if we could just go to my first slide, please. Um, cool, thanks very much. So, yeah, no, it's okay, you can skip this one. Brilliant, so uh, just jump straight in. So why choose AMPR? Uh, with the new code of practice uh, slowly but surely creeping up on the parking sector, uh, there's obviously number, uh, numerous considerations that need to be taken in regards to how AMPR will actually function uh, and what the expected standards are to ensure an accurate ticket issuing process. I believe the parking sector is fully expecting AMP, AMPR enforcement to grow massively because of the changes to the PCN charges. And rightly so, operators are now going to have to automate processes and reduce costs wherever possible in order to account for the changes that could impact revenue collection. I think some operators and clients have historically been hesitant to invest in APR due to some bad press and obviously upfront costs for things such as purchasing the cameras, buying the routers, SIM cards, um, hiring installation companies, uh, Camera, cameras that need to go on the poles to so the positioning um, and obviously other many uh, factors included in that but spending that upfront cost and introducing AMPR 
will potentially allow for staff to be redeployed into other areas of the business that may require attention and help remove human error during the ticket issuing process. Of course, you'll still need staff to check the contraventions via the back office system. And as part of the quality control check, which is mentioned in section 7.3.D, uh, but you're removing an entire area where potential mistakes can be made and therefore that initial upfront cost will likely be more beneficial in the long run. Next slide, please. Thanks so much. Uh, so who is responsible for ensuring AMPR aligns with the new code of practice? Uh, during the recent BPA webinar covering the new practice, I asked the question orientated around section 7.1, which in short states equipment must be maintained to a good standard in accordance with the manufacturer's operating requirements and those of the accredited parking associated to which the operator belongs. The answer received addressed the fact that governing bodies were not necessarily trained on the camera code of practice and not best to advise, which leads to question who is solely responsible for ensuring camera and ticketing accuracy, as it's common for motorists to blame system failures and camera inaccuracies. I personally believe the answer is that AMPR accuracy sits within the three main areas of responsibility. So from a software perspective, Providers like Zappark uh, will need to be able to guarantee cameras can integrate seamlessly and have a reliable AMPR engine that can facilitate numerous types of site setups, as obviously every site is different and this needs to be accounted for. Uh, operators won't just be relying on the hardware, but they're also going to be relying on system providers to ensure reads are being matched correctly and compared against permits that have been purchased through methods such as pay and display machines, cashless providers, and obviously pay on exit options. On the back of this, uh, the software must be able to handle potential matches as well as what to do in the instance of camera misreads or keying errors and basically determine whether a vehicle was overstayed or not purchased a valid parking session or returned within a no return period that is stated on the signage. Uh, eventually, when a contravention is raised, all of this information must then be available in a concise manner for the parking operator to review the evidence and make a decision before the ticket is progressed to the DVLA. Uh, speaking on behalf of Zap Park here, I can say that we are close to having the required functionality already available to facilitate the new code of practice, but we, and when I say we, I mean any enforcement software provider, uh, are responsible for ensuring operators can abide by the new code of practice by having the correct features available in time for when the new com code comes into place. So from a hardware perspective, camera suppliers and installation companies are at the forefront of ensuring high standards are maintained. We're at a pivotal stage with technology as the software within the cameras is continuously improving and therefore AMPR as a whole will becoming more and more dominant in the sector. There are obviously members of this panel who are better presented in talking about the hardware and actually do, uh, but operators are heavily reliant on the products within the market being of a high standard because AMPR is now becoming the core business model for a lot of private operators. And this is only going to continue to grow with the introduction of the new code. The cameras also need to be maintained frequently too, because as previously mentioned, the calibration is often questioned by motorists at the point of appeal. So both the supplier and operator need to take the necessary steps to prove the cameras are working properly. Lastly, you have the operators who are pretty much responsible for the entirety of the AMPR process. This comes down to choosing sufficient hardware, software, installation services, as well as providing the relevant training for members of staff. Uh, section 13.1.1 states that all enforcement staff are to complete certificated training and be audited by the relevant assessment body, which is massively important as AMPR contravention check-in is the last stage before notices are distributed to the motorists. So everything up to this point must follow a diligent process. Uh, a flawed AMPR setup is only going to make ticket issuing process difficult because more time and concentration will be needed to apply and guarantee whether a ticket has been generated correctly or not. This is why operators must solidify a stable internal AMPR process from start to finish. Ultimately, with AMPR advancing in the sector, it's important all parties involved are abiding by the new code and also educating their wider community. So clients such as facility managers, your housing associations, universities, NHS, H, NHS trust, sorry, Anyone um, essentially all understand the benefits of implementing AMPR and breaking the outdated negativity that AMPR has previously been labeled with. Next slide, please. 
So the new code of practice fundamentally falls down to parking experience. The end goal is to prevent parking abuse and implement technologies to ensure the motorist has a pleasant experience when visiting a car park. As an operator, if you have convoluted sites, this can lead to a bad customer experience, which can generate bad press. For me personally, if I feel I was unfairly ticketed and feeling a bit hard done by, then chances are I wouldn't use that car park again. And stances like this can obviously be detrimental for clients across all sectors due to revenue loss. On the other hand, having a user-friendly car park will allow operators to identify the actual issues that occur on a frequent basis, and then they can take the necessary actions to prevent this from happening. For example, if you have a large number of contraventions because vehicles are returning within the no return period, do you need to erect clearer signage or move the signage to a more suitable location? Uh, collating this sort of AMPR and enforcement data will essentially allow operators to manage sites more effectively and educate those sectors that haven't yet been convinced that AMPR can be utilized for complicated car parks of all sizes. And there is a lot more to AMPR than just enforcement. It dovetails into site management, which a lot of clients require uh, at the point of uh, winning contracts. They want to know the things like the peak times and how many visitors have returned to the car park, what types of vehicles are using the car park and whether it may be worth installing some more EV charging ports because you've got an increase of Teslas visiting. And all of this accessible information can only be collated by progressing down the AMPR enforcement model. Um, that is me done. Thank you all for listening and please feel free to ask any questions at the end. That's brilliant. Thanks, James. Um, I don't think that there's any doubt that uh, we're going to see more and more uptake of AMPR going forward, uh, which brings us on to our next guest um, or panelist, which is Peter Dowling, Head of Systems and Infrastructure for Base Entry Solutions. Um, his goals and aspirations ensure that Base Entry Solutions continue to be one of the leading car park management operators using the latest technology, delivering excellent customer service for new and existing business partners with the goal to see the business expand in line with their growth strategy across the UK. Peter is one of a team of three senior managers responsible for the setup and growth of Base Century Solutions, which started with two active sites in August 2019 and is now operating on 841 active sites as of April 2022. He is responsible for the rollout of AMPR throughout their entire portfolio from as far north as Newcastle down to Land's End. Um, I wasn't joking when I said star studded. Um, we've also got athletes on the panel today. Peter's a keen motorcyclist when he has his free time, uh, but has an impressive routine of running 10Ks every morning before work. So um, I think uh, that's something to aspire to. Um, Peter, over to you. Thanks, Wes. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, as Wes said, I'm Pete Darling, Head of Systems and Infrastructure at Base Entry Solutions. Uh, next slide, please. So Base Entry Solutions, as Wes said, was established August 2019, uh, starting with just two sites. Uh, by February 2020, we were operating on five sites, and then COVID hit, we went into national lockdown. Uh, at this point, we were still uh, performing manual lookups. Uh, this made enforcement extremely challenging to say the least. Uh, fast forward to now, we've grown significantly. We're operating on over 840 sites. Um, and one of our primary focuses being on installing AMPR in as many sites as possible and using technology throughout the business to drive efficiencies, uh, resulting in reduced overheads and increased revenues. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so in Base Central Solutions, we've got various payment channels. Uh, firstly, we've got pay and display machines. Uh, pay and display pay at the start of that parking duration. Uh, that does carry risks uh, with uh, keying errors uh, from the driver and also a risk of overstay. However, these machines aren't reliant on API accuracy. Uh, due to the device not needing to perform any lookups on entries into the car park. Uh, we've then got our in-house developed app, um, which we use for app-only payment sites. Uh, the method of payment here is paying at the end of the dura parking duration. The benefit for the driver there is that they're only paying for the exact duration um that we've paid for and there's no other states and that's of course the payment grace is overstayed 
Uh, there is a small downside. Some customers aren't as familiar with this model and therefore try paying for the parking at the, the beginning of the session, um, which can result in a, in a PCN for them overstaying that pay duration. Um, there is a reduced risk or no risk of keying error um, due to the fact that the driver needs to input the correct VRM into the mobile device, which then does a lookup um, on, on the entries. Um, this does, however, require a near on perfect um, read rate from the NPR cameras. Um, we do have workarounds uh, built in uh, whereby our control room staff can, can manually enter a VRM into the vehicle database, which will allow the customer to pay. However, this does rely on customer contacting us and being honest with their uh, entry times. Uh, next slide, please. We've also then got digital permit systems. Uh, digital permit system allows the driver to purchase a permit in advance for a longer duration. Uh, this places them on to the site whitelist um, in, in real time. Um, we can also then allocate base to those, those permits. Uh, this allows easier recognition for our officers on the ground uh, to enforce on out of bay um, contraventions and um, parking in the wrong bay. This can also be done in conjunction with the AMPR uh, whitelist on those sites. These, we find that these are ideal for residential sites, uh, not only for residents to use um, and have designated bays, um, but also for visitors. Some of our landowners um, have quite strict um, rules on when visitors can and can't uh, visit a site. So we find that using the digital permit system, scratch card options, for example, um, help us enforce on visitors adhering to the terms and conditions. Uh, next slide, please. So currently, for the use of AMPR through our base entry, um, currently all of our AMPR sites are in the traditional entry and exit setup. So we can only enforce on a vehicle being part of our valid uh, parking sessions, whitelist sessions, and no, no return contraventions. Uh, we've got these installed on a variety of sites from paying display, retail, commercial office, car parks, and residential sites. Some of the challenges we've found that we face though is hesitancy from landowners um, in having AMPR installed, and this is mainly due to the negative perception uh, from bad publicity that's being received. Obviously, it's never reported that having AMPR installed on the site increases compliance with site terms and conditions, um, and therefore increases uh, revenue for, for the landowner uh, by people adhering to those terms and conditions. And on residential sites, it solves uh, some of the issues arising from um, between residents for parking. Uh, so as an industry, we, we really need to improve the reputation of AMPR uh, and build confidence in the technology. Amongst those that are not familiar with it, and I believe that's something that will come with the new code. Um, some of the other challenges we face um, when installing AMPR is the quality of connectivity on some sites. Uh, the ma majority of sites are reliant on 4G. Uh, this isn't always great signal, whilst it's strong enough to send data through to the back office, it isn't always reliable enough to remotely manage those cameras. So it does mean um, a lot of on-site visits to uh, update firmwares, etc. NPR read rate accuracy can sometimes um, uh, cause issues with misreads or plates not being read at all. Um, it particularly causes issue at app-only payment sites. And often the environment in which the cameras are installed has a big impact on this. So careful planning of installs uh, with the right installers um, is always required. So NPR install isn't always possible due to a car park layout. Some, of, some sites just aren't a typical car park with no designated entry and exit and more just a piece of land, which takes me on to my next point, uh, which is the future of AMPR um, the technology. So currently in development with, with our partners is a variation of an AMPR camera, which will allow us to monitor individual parking bays rather than entries and exits. 
This allows us to enforce the contraventions such as illegal parking, visitors in permit holder bays, vice versa, um, and even combustion engines in EV bays. So this provide opportunities to install sites, uh, AMPR on sites that typically wouldn't be suitable and for a wider range of contraventions. This will free up patrol officers to focus on sites where no AMPR install of any kind is possible, making better use of the available resources and providing a great coverage for our clients. If I were to have a wish list uh, for back office providers, I think two of those items would be if we can link through to a database somehow of blue badge registered vehicles, which would allow us to do AMPR enforcement for blue badge contraventions. Um, and the second, second wish would be um, if we can have a rate calculator at site level within the back office, which would then automate whether as an operator we decide to request the outstanding parking balance from the driver or issue a PCM um, under the new code um, this is something we'd be able to do. So for locations, we'll continue to increase the number of AMPR sites, favouring them over manual patrols due to the ability to provide 24-7 cover, increasing the benefits of enforcement on private land to, to our landowners, um, but also placing a focus on residential sites and, and sites within the M25 boundary. Yeah, both of which will allow us to continue enforcement within the, uh, the higher tiers under the new code. Um, so that brings me to the uh, end of my short slides. But I hope you found it insightful. Thank you for listening. Um, if you've got any questions, uh, fire them over at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, interesting to see how uh, Base Entry are utilizing AMPR to better serve its clients in a better and more effective way. Um, our next panelist is Nick Hensel, Director of Watching UK. His goal is simply put to provide a seamless end-to-end -end AMPR parking solution that works. An interesting fact about Nick is that he was a professional trombone player until the age of 30. Um, and word on the street is that Nick is going to close this webinar off with a trombone, trombone solo, but uh, <laughs> see Nick over to you. <laughs> Thanks, that was great. Um, it's all true. So um, a bit about me, I started work in the CCTV industry in 1988. Um, I was age 19 as a, as a trainee CCTV engineer on Bournemouth Beach. Um, the beach CCTV system consisted of 52 cameras uh, covering seven and a half miles of seafront. Um, the, uh, it was the biggest uh, system of its kind in the UK at the time. Um, I worked on this and many other systems over the next few years for end users, including UK Home Office, Government, MOD sites, amongst others, um, carrying out installations, day-to-day -day maintenance, diagnostics and repairs. Um, in 2003, I started watching UK as a sole trader and incorporated as a limited company in 2007. Um, I just want to get my full screen up here, which I'm failing with. <clears throat> um, so we installed our first AMPR system in 2005, which used an analog camera connected to a PC that controlled an automatic barrier on a marina in pool in Dorset. Um, ever since then, we've been designing and specifying AMPR and surveillance systems for a cross-section of industries, including the parking sector. Watching UK offer a bespoke end-to-end -end solution, including, but not limited to, design, supply, configuration, installation, and commissioning of AMPR and surveillance systems. We also do um, provide uh, electrical and data installation and testing services, and we have a dedicated civils team. Um, we also operate, own and operate a, a fleet of van mounted cherry pickers uh, and have engineers covering most of the UK. Um, just want to talk a little bit about AMPR and its principles, um, important points to consider. Um, there's a number of headings here, camera selection, camera location, read distances, read angles, power availability, um, what do I fit my camera to? 
and best practice. So to cover some of those points, um, camera selection, there's many manufacturers who advertise their cameras as being capable of reading a VRM, uh, but few who can do it repeatedly and accurately. One of the key considerations with the new code of practice is that a any AMVR system must be fit for purpose. Given the potential to reduce, uh, sorry, the potential reduction in BCN revenue coming soon, it's important to get the very best reads possible. Camera location, uh, a common mistake is to compromise on positioning the camera, uh, but it's one of the key things that can make the difference between 95% and 100% read accuracy. Read distances, consider read distance when deciding on a camera's location. Too far and you risk missing reads due to vehicles tailgating, too close and a VRM can be missed due to overhangs on the rear of vehicles above uh, rear plates and especially spare wheels mounted on the back of four by fours. <clears throat> read angles, uh, consider the angle of the VRM to the camera. Is the vehicle able to drive in at, a, at an acute angle? meaning the plate isn't visible to the human eye. We use infrared to illuminate the plate and retroreflective properties of the plate to display a clear image at night. Too much of an acute angle means not enough light will reflect back to the camera, meaning poor read quality. We'll often specify traffic management as well to encourage vehicles to present the VRM at a better angle to the camera. Another consideration, uh, on a lot of car parks is power availability. Um, so a permanent 230 volt supply is always nearly always required to run a 24 hour AMPR system. Common mistakes are to specify the use of a lamp post or lighting installation, which has a switched 230 volt supply. Uh, existing lighting systems can, can often be modified though to suit AMPR. Alternative solutions are available in the form of a battery solution or if completely off grid, a solar and wind or solar and fuel cell solution can be specified. Solar on its own is just not viable to, to run a 24 hour AMPR system in the UK, despite, despite what some people, some people may tell you. Um, what do I fit my camera to? It's a common question. All lighting columns have a maximum loading limit or rating, which is calculated by the manufacturer. Most lighting columns will support the installation of a single camera and equipment enclosure, but many won't be rated to support multiple devices. For example, a pair of light fittings, as well as an AMPR camera or cameras and its equipment will almost always exceed the load rating of that lighting column. We often specify dedicated camera columns that are rated to carry all the equipment required and more in a single or multi-camera AMPR installation. Um, there's a lot more security and uh, less risk to vandalism um, particularly with these, these columns and, and the addition of anti-climb guards. Best practice. Um, this is mentioned in the new code of practice and is key to an AMPR system that performs well. Specifying the best camera in the world but fitting it in the wrong place or setting it up incorrectly will result in a poor and inaccurate read rate. This camera's performance would be beaten by a more affordable camera positioned and set up perfectly. Best practice also means having a well-designed and maintained AMPR system. Watching UK are leaders in the AMPR field and we're good at what we do. So please use the right installer and get it right first time, every time. Thanks very much. Thanks, Nick, that's great. Um, we're seeing lots of questions coming through. Can I just ask um, and stress again, if you have any questions, please can you post them in the, the Q&A box? Um, we've got a few coming through on the chat, so I just wanna make sure that we get your questions at the end of the session. So please populate those questions in the chat box. Um, our next uh, panelist is Steve Walker. He's Managing Director and Joint Founder of MAV Systems. Uh, previous to establishing MAV, Steve had had been 13 years as, as a technology company producing mobile data and control room applications. Uh, this was before the time of uh, mobile data was being available on phones. Um, then moving to mobile computing and early AMPR developments in police vehicles before identifying a niche that MAV now occupy as an independent AMPR camera supplier and starting MAV with co-directors who are still in the business. 
is now highly involved in the technical matching of customer needs to product development by having an elect uh, electronic software foundation before selling out to sales and management. Um, over to you, Steve. Thanks very much. So, uh, uh, MAV Systems, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we, uh, uh, as Wes has said, uh, really set ourselves up to concentrate solely on AMPR. Uh, I guess in recent times that's moved into AMPR and uh, other intelligent uh, video anal analytics that can be put onto there. But to date, the majority of our cameras, 30,000 of them have been sold into uh, the AMPR market. That market spreads all over the world, 45 countries, 15 years of sales to date. And predominantly our, our core markets are parking, probably a third of our sales, uh, the law enforcement, police, and then civil enforcement for bus lanes and moving traffic offences. Uh, increasingly smart uh, cities are being able to use the cameras in, in uh, driving uh, efficiencies and information about traffic flow. Uh, and uh, one of the interesting users alongside that is for uh, town planning, where survey companies are also using the cameras as temporary installs. Uh, we've, over the years, continuously developed the cameras. We uh, plow back a, a large proportion of our profit into R&D. We've currently got uh, six full-time R&D engineers working on design and manufacture. But, sorry, the, the, the design, everything from the circuit boards inside our cameras uh, through to the housings. And over the years, we've built uh, a very large base of loyal business partners, uh, customers that have worked with us, uh, helped us develop by giving us feedback on our cameras that we've been able to uh, build into new features uh, within those cameras, really close relationships. And I've got to give credit, I'm afraid I've taken over uh, due to personal circumstances from Berinda, who was due to give this, but he's built our parking business up by being there for our customers. And so we have a, a really strong linkage into uh, the training and uh, the relationship with our customers and what they can uh, tell us of their challenges so that we can use technology hopefully to uh, uh, ease their route to market. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so 10,000 plus uh, intelligent cameras. And before that we had analog cameras out in the field. Um, uh, currently in use within the parking management systems. Uh, they go back into a number of uh, back offices, Zap Park uh, being used in many of those systems, some of our customers having their own back office, and some of them with different feeds into multiple back office. So even people that have got their own uh, system will co-feed into Zap Park and others for being able to uh, provide multiple bearers, give them more utilization of the single camera into uh, multiple platforms. Uh, we've also been able uh, in partnership with customers to give not only the standard product, but uh, develop uh, unique designs of the product to make the installation quicker. So as Nick said, the uh, use of specialist uh, installers and uh, giving routine to some of the installations will make the installation a lot more uniform, which means that you can get rid of a lot of the problems that Nick's identified on. Uh, whilst it, it's true to say that modern cameras can read almost anything from any angle, uh, what you'll always find is if you can give it the best chance, you'll get the best results. So we would always advocate using good installers uh, doing uh, some preparation work to get the cameras in the right place and then using cameras that can then be uh, zoomed, focused, set up very quickly on site, remotely when you need to do some refinement of the camera setups and uh, get the system working to the best performance. And as I go on to say later in this presentation, some uh, just regular reviews on that that you can do through uh, intelligent back office use. Uh, we can cover 12 meter lane width uh, down to single lane use and we've got a variety of cameras that can cover all of those. So there's a, a, a range that can be uh, produced for everything from single bay parking right through to multi-lane uh, occupancy. 
and everything from a bollard through to a, a, a camera post mounted solution. Uh, one of the things you don't get a lot of control about is uh, the different seasons and the, the movement of the sun, the day and night. Probably in the UK, we probably would find that 50% of the parking is happening in darkness. As you look at the very short days and the usage of car parks as people go to work and leave, uh, they're arriving in the dark and leaving in the dark. Uh, and yet they're driving in with sun right behind the camera, right in front of the camera as it uh, sets and falls. And, um, and so you need a camera that's able to adapt. And so we've continuously uh, advocated the use of two cameras within our solutions, one using infrared, so we get 24 hour operation, one using color to give really good uh, um, overview images. They can be used for human verification in the back office really important part, especially in that nighttime period to get the best images you can. And so we've done a lot of advances in recent times to produce black and white images at night, but certainly images that you can identify and confirm that the car that you've got the license plate from, when you do a DVLA check and do all the verification that's required before you issue any tickets, actually does match the vehicle that, that uh, you believe has uh, created a contravention. So a lot of work goes into providing the right cameras for the solution that we need to uh, get out there. Um, a lot of our cameras, we don't see them again. So out of the 10,000, we get a very small number of them coming back. And I believe that all of them are still utilized. There is not an eBay uh, demand for secondhand cameras. So they're all out there doing their work, giving the customers that bought them a good return on the hardware investment. And, and through the life of those cameras, we're continuously adding new features into them that can be uploaded. Uh, a lot of that can be automated into uh, people's systems so that they can approve a new build of software, check it's working for them, giving them better performance, new features, and then roll it out and all the configuration onto their site uh, remotely from uh, over the uh, links to sites. And if anything's necessary to be fixed, we don't run our RMA or repair center as a profit center. It's just a service there to keep the systems working. And we cover everything from cameras that have been crashed into by cars uh, while people park, uh, cameras in the wrong place, seeing the wrong things that have been shot at and come back in, and uh, just other ones that have uh, uh, needed attention over time. And we just run that through. Thanks very much. New slide. So just a couple more slides just on some of the things that um, are available through AMPR. AMPR, whilst it is just giving you a number plate, there's an awful lot of other data that can be provided by the camera and uh, is useful in providing the verification. So all the, what we would call metadata, additional data that sits around that number plate. And that can start from just being the, um, uh, time and date right through to uh, information from radars, triggers, speed information, uh, secondary cameras. We have uh, outrigging cameras that can give uh, overviews alongside the core camera to, to link additional pictures into the solution. And quite clearly nowadays with AMPR uh, being a common feature and people sometimes not wanting to be captured, we need to deal with the issues where plates are uh, by accident damaged, incorrect, manipulated, have things uh, covering them. Uh, I'm sure you'll have, many people have seen uh, images where people are just trying to avoid the camera uh, by doing various activities. And so a number of additional features within the camera can allow us to trigger from motion uh, particular parts of the image to create uh, a no read but a visual image that can then be matched to a vehicle that either entered or left a uh, previous time. So, so matching can happen through uh, association and by being able to analyze the video information alongside just the AMPR. So there can be verification even when the full AMPR image hasn't been caught on one of the occasions of uh, an in or an out. Uh, we're also able to add secondary computing. So alongside the 
frame by frame video anal analytics that's happening on the plate and that's that's being prov provided by multiple engines uh, we can then send it through for secondary verification so we get cross matching for increasing uh, performance and uh, read confidence and we can also use local computers to provide uh, dedicated services. So talking into pay and display machines, uh, the barrier controls, payment integration, and, and linking into that, not just a simple control of a relay, but actually building in business processes uh, in conjunction with the supplier so that if there's any communication failure to the back office, uh, the actual local information uh, can decide to open the barrier and let people out, even though the links over the uh, cellular network, for example, have failed. So uh, a lot of close integration to, to get that uh, solution working for our customers. Uh, we can provide uh, multiple bearer capability. So a single read could be sent into multiple back offices, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Zap Park plus others, and uh, use that for um, completely different uh, mechanism. So one might just be the parking and the contraventions, the other might be into an analysis for uh, retail purposes to try and work out who's in or out of the car park. Um, I'll go through the big list that's there, we can uh, look at those over time, but the additional services through the metadata uh, enable uh, a lot of additional services. So whilst we're seeing that people are wanting to um, set the uh, system up so that uh, we're monitoring the car park and, and contraventions. There's a lot of value in the other data that's being created there. So being able to look at your occupancy of your car parks, who's coming and going, how long they're spending there, all this adds into the planning of your car parks uh, and can be a service and a, a, a revenue stream that could be used to um, create greater value from the car parks and, and utilisation of them when they're not there. Uh, previous people have talked about the EV and the uh, charging, and there's obviously a big trend towards that, and, and there needs to be some uh, control around how people are using or abusing those devices that we can help with. Next slide, please. Uh, and finally, I'd sort of reinforce everything that Nick said earlier on. Um, uh, get the physical layout right. Uh, but then use the back office and the information that you've got in there to keep on refining because uh, these systems you'll find that uh, people change their way of parking the the, the layout changes uh, things that change over time the cameras become dirty and you can actually use the information that's coming back live from the site to to create adaptive maintenance uh, so you don't have to visit sites on a, a, a a predefined basis, you can use the information that's coming back from the cameras to, to work out your maintenance cycle, reduce the number of times you need to go to site, um, and under uh, look at underlying uh, influences that are on there. If if you see a big drop of uh, read rate at a particular time, it's then worth somebody actually looking at the live video from the camera to, to see whether something's happened on site, for example. Uh, a lorry that was delivering is literally parked in front of the camera and meant that you cannot see the people coming and going and take take action on, on that basis. Uh, as I say, typically AMPR cameras are all good nowadays. There isn't so, you know, all the cameras can read. It's the additional layers of value that can be added on top of the basic AMPR that really makes a difference to the operators. Um, so conscious of time, uh, I think the uh, last couple of things there is just to uh, look at how the systems are giving you information that in uh, an increasingly um, litigious world that we live, you, you make sure that when the tickets go out, they are as accurate as possible. So looking for things such as health checks coming from the camera, making sure all the timings from the camera are incredibly accurate. Uh, and so using cameras that are on well, evidential quality uh, so that they're actually linking back in and, and can be um, approved to a, a known level of accuracy so that uh, you can dispel any appeals that happen based on uh, spurious uh, timings. And there's nothing worse than if somebody has got their iPhone giving them a 
date and location that they were there, and they can see that there's an offset of time in, in the uh, offence they've been given, it, it just completely uh, undermines everything. So really making sure that you get cameras that give you all that uh, evidential information, really important. Thank you very much. That's great. Uh, thanks, Steve. It's uh, incredible to see the, the development of this technology and its versatility. Um, our next and last panelist is Lawson Noble, who's a Chief Technical Officer at Baxter Recognition Systems. He's a computer scientist and has worked in computer graphics since 1980 and exclusively in ANPR for 24 years. Uh, Lawson's primary goal was to help develop the fledging ANPR industry into what it is today by creating innovative and affordable hardware and software and believes that he's starting to see the finish line. In terms of achievements, he developed a CitySync ANPR engine installing 40,000 lanes before the business was sold in 2010. Um, Lawson, over to you. Good, uh, good morning. Thank you for that. Um, hope you can hear me okay. It's, uh, it's, it's some, we've had some very interesting uh, presentations uh, so far. So, um, and it sort of neat, neatly segues into the software and hopefully uh, an insight into how it works and the sort of challenges uh, that we have. Um, so next slide, please. Um, Vaxta uh, has been in the NPR industry, uh, a relative newcomer, really. It's, it's about seven, eight, eight years. And um, you'll know us probably for, for a license plate recognition. Sorry, we, we, we have a lot of US customers, so we tend to use the word LPR than AMPR. Um, but we do other analytics too, and they all feed off each other. So on the, on the, basic, the basics of AMPR, you'll see make model color recognition, et cetera. But we also read container codes, uh, train codes, aircraft numbers, they're all very similar, uh, but they all have their own challenges. And being able to sort of read corrugations on a, on a container, et cetera, means the software has to handle quite difficult um, lighting conditions, which helps in the basic uh, NPR. Genesis, you'll see at the bottom there, it's quite interesting. Um, that's a general purpose OCR reader and can be used to read uh, just about anything. And some of the projects, uh, just to lighten it a bit for you, uh, we've been reading the tags on cow's ears, um, <laughs> thousands of cameras for that. And we also read uh, tickets on fast food, et cetera. All of that technology, again, feeds back into the core software um, for um, AMPR. So next slide. Um, the the, uh, the the this company is spread over our four uh, four locations around the world, and again that gives us various challenges. Um, uh, most of the software development is actually done in, uh, in in Madrid, and because I've worked in the industry a long time, I have a lot of a lot of input on on what we do. It does mean that if you any any of you are selling abroad, we can usually give twenty four hour support in in most regions, and you'll see there we've we've done about twenty five thousand lanes uh, across there. Uh, next slide, please. Is uh, the basics here uh, are, are the team, the people. We're a people based company. Uh, we've we've all um, been in the industry a long time, and uh, and and hopefully you'll know that we give pretty good support. Um, the that also means that we've got knowledge of the market, having worked in a long time. But the the core of the company is the people and the technology. Um, you've got to have good technology, but you've got to know what 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 to, what to do with that. Innovation is very important for us. We have continuous innovation. I, I do a lot of the documentation. It's a bit of a nightmare keeping up because we have new products being developed for different parts of the world all the while. And, and that sort of uh, needs to be kept up to date. Um, so next slide, please. Um, this is mainly for the parking market, but we also sell into the different markets like smart, smart city is, is, is a new word really, but it's anything to do with traffic and uh, monitoring around large urban areas or congestion charging, um, uh, pollution zones, uh, low emission zones, that sort of thing. Do, do tolling work and a lot of law enforcement. Again, they've all got slightly different challenges. And um, with the parking industry, for example, you've got to get the plate right. Um, police on patrols, they get a plate slightly wrong. No one really knows. But a parking market, when you're going to charge, it, it does matter. So next slide, please, which is what we're here to talk about. The code of practice. Now, from um, 
I'm not a parking expert from, from but from our point of view, looking at the the basics, um, the revenues are, be are being squeezed, um, and therefore um, you can't afford to make mistakes. So as we move forward, um, AMPR systems have got to be more accurate than than they have been traditionally. Um, where appropriate, they've got to be able to run on a low cost platform because uh, certain operators or certain car parks couldn't justify the very expensive kit that has been put in traditionally and obviously deliver value for money. And that's cost of ownership, which is interesting what uh, St Steve said to you there. Some cameras will be more expensive than others, but some have got more features than others and it's the cost of ownership that actually make the difference when you're, when you're choosing. And uh, we, we hope with what we, we, we offer on various platforms, you can, um, you can achieve these aims. So next technology, next slide please, that is the technology. Um, just to summarize, those, those images while, while you're reading all the boring text, I mean, that you'll get a copy of this afterwards, so I'm not gonna read it out line by line. But those are all real images from some of our new technology. We have a, an engine called the Phobos engine in, in development, and um, we're just rolling that out in the States at the moment which uses a combination of machine and deep learning, which we think is quite, uh, which is quite different. Um, and these are all real reads that we've been testing on and you'll see they're very challenging. Um, and as Nick said earlier, it's all to do with camera positioning, et cetera. You want, you want to be within about 20 degrees in any direction to get a good read where possible, but there's always gonna be examples where that is impossible. Um, or, or you've got some that weather damage. I'll, I'll, we'll whisk through a few slides in a, in a moment showing examples of that. And the, the technology has got to be able to cope with that. And the, the engine uh, that Baxter developed is a font independent engine. So what that basically means is if we see a plate that we've not seen before, um, someone's got a customized plate or a 4D gel plate or something that's you know, on the edge of legality, we'll have a pretty good go at reading it. Uh, we don't need uh, prescribed fonts that we used to trace around, uh, et cetera, U using a template matching. It's, it's, it doesn't use that technology anymore. The recognition rates, I mean, the, the UK Home Office uh, rates were 93.1% 20 years ago. They haven't changed those figures, but now we're regularly achieving far, far higher than 99% if everything's set up correctly. Um, we've done about 99.6% on about four independence tests in, in the last uh, year. Okay, next slide, please. Um, the, as I mentioned earlier, the, the global office gives, gives us some pretty horrific plates. I mean, look at some of the things, look at the bot bottom of the third row there. I mean, some of the American plates, you, you'll find, you know, gunshot holes in them, et cetera. And having to read those gives us a lot of challenges. And again, you see lovely European plates that uh, after this, it makes, uh, makes life easier. It makes you wonder why anyone gets any of them wrong having seen this. Next slide, please. Is the same with the Middle East. Um, the, the, we have to tend, if you have ever, you do sell in the Middle East, you certainly with Arabic plates, you tend to have to use twice the resolution. Um, which puts strains on the camera processing or PC processing, et cetera, to do that because some of the characters are just like, you know, it could be a fly on the plate, but it's not, it's a, it's, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a zero or whatever. But um, again, the spin-off from that comes to the European plates. So next slide, please, is a few um, examples of, the bit, I've sort of split these into what you'll typically see. So basically not all engines are the same. You may think that because most people show you demonstrations that are always gonna work. The camera's always gonna be head on. You always got a perfect plate. Anyone can get that right. Um, but it's when you can't uh, prescribe that. It's you've got, you've got angles you hadn't thought of. You've got someone turning into an entrance you hadn't really thought of. And, uh, and that, that's where things get interesting. You can't always have the perfect setup. So the next uh, four slides are just showing examples of extreme angles if you're using for parking enforcement. Um, so here we are. This one was uh, in, in Finland, which is quite interesting. Our mate model color recognition not only read that plate correctly, but we identified it as a, as a blue mini as well, which is quite interesting. So the next one is um, uh, one of our sites in America. I've actually spoken to this owner and said, please, will you straighten your camera? Um, and it's, it's well over 20 degrees. And you'll find a lot of engines will fail at about five degrees from the horizontal. And his answer to me was, well, why it works? <laughs> the next one you'll see, uh, 
again, um, was, was from what we spoke about earlier, which is electric charging bays. That's a horrific angle, horrific plate. I've actually blocked out the last character. So we, as with all of them, so you can't read it. But that, that's, that is a challenge the industry faces because um, some of our Singapore cameras have been put on the opposite side to the charging bays and give a much better you know, read, several bays with one camera. Um, if you're gonna use pinhole cameras or short, short wide angle cameras close up, you do have a problem because a lot of the vehicles charge from the front and the people come and stand in the way you've got to allow for that sort of thing. Okay, so next to dark and light, you can't always control you know uh, what what you're going to see um this is a, a sort of a, mi a misty night in in spain actually um her horrific image um and again you the software will can see black where you can't um the more of a, the other problem which steve was talking about is when the sun is behind the camera as here um you don't you want to try and avoid this at all costs but if you have to have an image like this then you're going to get retro reflectivity back the sun is reflecting back from behind you within about 20 degrees you'll get this sort of effect and most npr engines will fail at that point because they can't trace around all characters this is an example of that you can't trace around these characters but the way that the baxter engine works we're guessing <laughs> a very technical term there, guessing what the play, our character would be rather than saying, I really don't know what this is. We think this is a 90% chance of that being a Y, so I'm going to say it's a Y because you'd rather have that and make a decision. Um, the, we hadn't have something that um, Nick, Nick mentioned as well is the obscuration. Um, it's obviously best to, to have front face facing cameras if you can, because the plates are cleaner for a start in the winter. Um, you'll get a vortex at the back, you'll get dirty plates at the back in, in the winter. Um, and again, I, uh, I've noticed more recently, there's a lot of overhanging uh, boots like we, we see here. And if the camera is too steep, because sometimes you do have to have it steep, you'll get this thing where the, the, the characters are actually cut off. And again, our type of engine with its machine learning and deep learning will attempt, won't always get it right, you know, we're, we're, all, we're, we're, saying we're all human, we're all AI, um, we'll, we'll attempt to get that right and, and work out what it is rather than saying, I just can't see that character. Uh, next one was uh, from a site in Holland where we didn't anticipate the angle because they were turning into the entrance. It wasn't wasn't supposed to be when the car park were designed. But again, we can read up to about 45 degrees. Don't recommend it, but there we go. Um, if you happen to read rear plates, you often have temporary plates. And the nightmare with temporary plates is you've got bolts and clamps around which will touch the edge. Uh, and, and so uh, you've got to make a decision. So we have sort of have software that works out whether, whether it was... Um, whether it's a actually, you know, what, what sort of character was it? An L was it obscure in the bottom? You got the same problem in the states with plate carriers. Uh, weather, um, you, you can't predict that. Not even the next day these days. And again, if you if you've got uh, for, uh, snow, you'll get partially obscured plates. In this case, it's just a flake on top of on top of the L. But you the the two ways around this, you want to take as many grabs as you can, so you want a decent speed of engine and. Uh, and you want the sort of engine that can work work out what that character is. Next one is a frosty a frosty situation. I really didn't think we'd read this, but we did. Um, where you've got uh, the IR is diffused uh, by the frost. Um, if you're having to use if you're using uh, co color rather than IR, as Steve was saying, you can use both. Then again, you might have the problems of temporary plates. And on the next one, which is the next slide, is a plate defeater. Now, the most these are becoming more popular, uh, totally illegal, of course. And in this case, they've put the defeater over the complete plate. I probably should have left some of the rear plate on so you see the really good contrast on that one. Um, the fashion is to cover one or two characters with a plate defeater with an IR defeater. And again, you want an engine that will cope with very low contrast levels or use the color. Uh, color mode, if you, if possible, to actually read through that, because IR would have uh, would have defeated would have defeated IR. The software um, this engine I've been talking about was originally developed for for PCs, um, and but obviously we've moved on to different platforms. So under PCs nowadays we have Windows and Linux, and on the next slide you'll see what, where else we go. So next slide, please, is um, is on the edge. So um, the if you want a um, a, a low cost camera then the, the, these are the sort of low cost 
cameras that will run the software at the edge, the CTDV, but the one you'll spot in there, which is the professional math camera. So that's our one professional platform. If you want a dual lens global shutter camera, the rest are rolling shutter cameras, and it depends on your on your budget. You pay your money, and uh, Steve's had some very good points on, on that. Um, next slide, please. Um, we also do our Android uh, version, which is the same engine. So the same engine will run on uh, on the new MAV camera. It'll run on some of those other cameras on the PC, and the same engine will run like lightning on, on an Android uh, at, a, at a crazy rate, about 30 milliseconds on, on a typical uh, Galaxy uh, phone. And again, that way, way you can get accuracy and um, if you're doing car park audits or even driving along with a phone, you'll be able to be able to capture and all of our software transmits to uh, back offices uh, that we've all been talking about using uh, UTMC amongst other things. Um, you, what's one thing about our software, you can transmit to more than one back office. So obviously from a parking point of view, we send to the Zach there's that back, back office, but you might want to use it for other things. So our own back office is Helix. You can store hundreds of millions of reads and that allows you to verify if someone was there or not, allows you to do analytics, et cetera, have alarms, hot lists. If you've got someone who regularly doesn't pay, um, you can get a telegram message on your phone or your watch if a certain card's come in, if they've got a warden in the area. It's because you may not want to find him. You may want to sort of have a word with him on, it, on his first offense, et cetera. And uh, and next slide, please. You can you can actually get produce this sort of analytics. This is all included with within Helix. So, for example, a lot of uh, shopping centres in Spain use this, so they can see uh, the traffic building up at certain times of the day. Uh, maybe it's lunch hour, maybe whatever. So they know that within um, El, El Corte Inglés uh, use it, so they'll know that they have to have more staff on the tills about thirty to thirty minutes after that. So um, as a summary. Um, technology is not all the same, engines are not all the same, but hopefully with, uh, with what we're doing and what, and what you're going to see from us in the future, you, you'll be able to get a, a higher accuracy and a better return for your money. Thank you. Um, thanks, Peter. Um, that was really good. Um, we've got some questions now. I mean, you mentioned about the um, the code of um, the uh, the single code of practice and how it could impact revenue and parking enforcement companies, which is a concern that I think many many share. So it's interesting to see how ANPR will um, adopt going forward to offset this. Um, we've got many questions coming through. Um, we'll start off with Nick. Um, Nick, first question here is. Uh, what are the minimum number of spaces needed in a car park for an ANPR to be viable, particularly in the residential situations? There's no minimum, really. Um, it's down to cost at the end of the day, and that's what needs to be weighed up. Um, it's, uh, it's purely uh, down to the cost issue, I would suggest. There are, as others have mentioned, some car parks that just are not suitable for ANPR, and um, they won't, um, they just, it just won't be possible sometimes in some scenarios to cover all of the spaces in a, in a given car park. One example of that would be where you have shared spaces, so general spaces um, for general use, and then maybe permit holder spaces, um, or where you have a car park where some people who are permit holders don't want to be part of the scheme. That's always a challenge. Um, so yeah, there's no, but there's no real sort of minimum number to be fair. Okay. Um, Steve, a uh, question coming for you. Um, there's now an appetite for operators to introduce ANPR to smaller car parks, such as staff and residential car parks. However, expensive cameras that uh, perhaps have uh, features that are not required in, in this setting can prevent this. Do you may have planned to produce a model that is more accessible from a price point to cater for smaller car parks? That do not necessarily require the need for high speed, long distance, wide lane reads. You're on mute, Steve. Hi, Steve. Steve, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> nice one. Uh, sorry. Uh, the answer is yes. We've got a range of cameras there that can give that um, uh, small 
uh, site uh, a, a reasonable chance. So um, we're not talking about the same as just buying a, a CCTV camera. It, it's still a dedicated camera with the processing on board and everything else uh, that's in there. But uh, absolutely, it, the, the lower cost uh, range of the IQ, the 130 camera uh, can be installed. It's a, a smaller camera, um, doesn't require as much uh, infrastructure to hold it in place. It's a lighter camera. Uh, and, and I have to say that although there's a lot of, um, I would say this because I'm a camera manufacturer, there's a lot of emphasis on the capital cost of the camera. Uh, but you start to look at it in context of the lifetime, and, and Lawson made a, a, a very valid point there. It's all about the lifetime costs. And when you look at, you know, even if you took thousands of pounds and spread it over a five or six year life of a camera, you're talking about 50 pounds a month as the actual capital cost. You know, if you put it onto a, a leasing package, uh, that's probably equivalent to what you're paying for your SIM costs. So I, I think the idea that, that uh, cameras are an expensive part of the solution. Often the soft digs that I've seen people do on sites can be as expensive as the camera was. So uh, it, it's very valid that we shouldn't be, you know, we, we need to produce competitive cameras. It's a very competitive environment that we sell into um, and uh, they need to be value for money. But I, I think we get that balance right on, in the main. And um, But there certainly are cameras that can can be uh, made available into that environment very cost effectively for you. Get in touch with Burinda, I think is the answer to that one. <laughs> I've got one here for you, James. Um, can you explain how ANPR will support the higher and higher plus contravention tiers in the new parking act? Um, so obviously the contraventions are going to be more standardized now, um, certainly speaking from our perspective, obviously being a software provider of the enforcement side, um, we do already have the ability to be able to set up uh, charging banning or, and you can associate different uh, charge amounts to a specific contravention. So essentially when a contravention is recorded and comes through to the system, uh, number one, we can have it default to the type of contravention that it is, whether it's kind of an overstay or a no return. Um, and then on the back of that, we can we can allocate, yeah, uh, banding to that charge. So you, you have your different mounts. And again, we can we can facilitate that for in London and outside of London as well. Um, if you are watching and you are using the Zappox system, speak to the support guys. Um, they should be able to talk more about it as well and potentially enable it on the system. But yeah, we, we certainly will be able to facilitate uh, different kind of charge levels across the contraventions already. Okay, thanks, um, thanks James. Um, a question here for um, Steve, another one for you. Um, when will the additional services from MAV be available to operators? Uh, so if they're the ones uh, outlined in there, so the, some of the analytics that can sit alongside, uh, we have a package called IQ4 that's already uh, sold alongside it. It's a complementary system to the enforcement. It's not an enforcement, but it gives you some of the retail uh, insights that uh, I outlined in there. That's available right now. But um, in the way that we present the data from the camera, the metadata comes out in a, um, a, a format that, that provides every uh, piece of information that you can then uh, develop your own back office. So there's a lot of uh, work can be done by people to, if they want to create their own IPR around the, the data rather than just buying in a service. So can develop tools and techniques around, around that in their own right, uh, or plug into um, off the shelf solutions. So uh, again, some um, uh, pushing back onto Berinda, but the IQ4 is, is something that's been used by a few people for, for uh, a, a hosted back office service that can look at things like those dwell times and um, uh, analysis of vehicles in and out and, and different levels of service from that. So hopefully that's answered that question. Um, lots of questions here um, around the, the hardware. Um, one for both Steve and Lawson. Um, um, and Lawson, I'll ask you to answer first, but with reference to the code, what are the maintenance requirements for Vexter and MAV cameras? More of a hardware uh, problem, I think. Yeah. Um, so, so Steve, on the on the maintenance. 
Yeah, the, the, the main thing is that we provide um, health checks from all the intelligent cameras. So they're, they're providing information about any... Um, so e even in an overnight period when there's no reads happening, you can know that the camera is still operating because it can be sending you regular health checks coming through. So it can confirm all the infrareds still working, that it's active, it's got power, how many... Uh, reads are stacked up in the queues for the various uh, bearers that are there. So there's a lot of uh, positive in information you could send back to a dashboard to show that your cameras were all very active. Yeah. And then some of it comes down to the profiling of um, that we mentioned, uh, a few of us have mentioned in the different presentations to look at when your read rate is dropping off that is the clearest indication to, to go and do it. You, you might set a maximum period to go out to site to do physical inspections. Um, but if you're in a coastal area and you get sea frets and the um, salty air uh, dries out on the front of a lens of a camera, you're gonna need to do that more often than you are in Leicestershire. Where, so, so going and cleaning the camera is probably the greatest um, thing. So. Yeah, in, in that scenario, we've developed special sun shields that, that actually vent the air away from the front glass to make sure that the glass, uh, and we use that on uh, gantries over motorways for the uh, spray coming off the back of vehicles. So rather than it being a sun shield, it's actually protecting more from the environment that it's in. So, so there are preventative measures you can take as well as regular maintenance, but the clearest indication is to look at the um, run rates that you're getting off these cameras and, and look for drop-offs from what you'd expect them to be. So it's profiling yeah. and, and monitoring. Yeah, some, some of our customers uh, connect to two back offices. So they go to Helix as well, uh, which I mentioned earlier, which has a camera monitoring function. Um, so we can talk and say from, from a MAV camera or an access camera, we can get a heartbeat. Um, and what that ha what that lets you know is when the last time it w it was operating, and you can say, take me an image every ten minutes, whether there's a car there or not. Mm -hmm. So uh, as a you can get alarms, etc. So you, you can see if things are, are dropping off. And as Steve said, I totally agree with that. Nanotechnology on lenses, that sort of thing, to uh, prevent it. But you know from a software point of view software doesn't break um so it's not going to change what could change is if they introduce a new type of number plate or something but, but it's more of a, of, a, of a hardware monitoring problem so. excellent um a question here for uh, mav and uh, vexter again can the vexter engine be reinstalled on mav cameras uh yes i, I did a text reply on that the um the, the answer is uh, more with Steve. We put we ported to the to the new range of map cameras. So the quick answer is no, not on the old ones. It's just the new ones, which uh, I'm not sure how much you've announced of Steve yet. So, yeah, but oh, yeah, I use out there now. It's on the website, and yep. um, so so that's a, an open platform camera that can take um, uh, multiple uh, 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 AMPR systems. And we've done a lot of work with Backstore over the last year to make sure that they. Their camera operates. Uh, their software operates uh, incredibly well within the camera. Um, so yeah, the existing IQs uh, are based around a, a closed architecture, uh, which has good and bad points uh, around it. Whereas the AIQ is using um, a Jetson platform running Linux, and so it's more of an open platform that that allows multiple. Um, software to be loaded onto it uh, and as i say we've done a lot of joint development work with backstore to make sure that's that's absolutely set up for them okay thank you um james another one's come here uh come through for you although anpr reduces human error when taking uh when taking note of the vehicle reg the process as a whole still still needs a manual check for minor reg mistakes uh mistakes made on payments um, which does leave room for human error. When will Zapark release a function which automatically identifies minor error mistakes, original mistakes made on payments to help reduce, generate APR to check and reduce human error? Cool. Um, yeah, great question, this one. Um, for those that are currently using the Zapark system, um, and using the APR module, they will know that the, the, the checks kind of have to be completed manually at this point. Now, we are taking the code of practice away and reviewing it and obviously seeing what we need to implement 
Um, so that's kind of what the features are that we need to introduce in order for um, our members to be able to abide by the practice. Um, and one of those is going to be a kind of fuzzy whitelist check. So uh, again, I don't know those that use it, but we, we, we already have something that will allow uh, a fuzzy number plate match uh, across uh, readings, whether it's in and out. Um, we want to kind of reverse that for the, the whitelist side of things as well. So when those payment sessions come in, it's automatically going to check those similar um, submissions. So where you do have your keying errors, um, we want to be able to automatically uh, do kind of a look up to those and match them uh, against the registration in, uh, in question when you're actually going through the ANPR checker. Um, obviously, it's going to automate that process, um, but obviously increase the accuracy as well. Um, and hopefully find those sessions that do have keying errors or, or, or miss um, characters implemented. So when that's going to be released, um, I can't tell you definitively, uh, but obviously with the, the practice coming in, we are aiming to have it um, ready and functional for, for, for when that uh, standard actually just comes in. So, yeah. Thanks, James. If I could just uh, add on to that, one of the things that we've looked at and uh, implemented with the dual processor and you can do through the back offices as well is to uh, cross check from the plate patch itself. So sometimes, you know, from an IQ, you're getting it from the MAV engine to start with. There's no reason why that uh, same read couldn't be passed through the VAC store. And we've done some checks with Lawson in the past to just feed uh, rot the actual plate patch and get a second engine to do a comparison. And that can give you an extra level of verification on, on that. So, so there are software techniques you can add in as middleware or uh, other techniques to, to help the uh, human operator identify that. It, it, it depends what you identify the risk and uh, the frequency that that's happening uh, in different situations, I guess. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. Um, Nick, I've got a question here for you. It's um, how do how do the cameras communicate with the back office servers like ZPark and is broadband required? Uh, so in general, um, we would recommend a, a 3G, 4G router. Um, so it's completely uh, reliant on the mobile network. Um, we can in, supply and install roaming SIMs, so it can have four to five networks available to the SIM, so if one network, local network goes down, it'll hop onto the next one and so on. Having said that, um, if broadband is available on site and it's um, easily cabled to and so on, then we can also utilize that. Um, we, we do use that uh, on, on some sites where, for example, we're also running um, AMPR in conjunction with uh, CCTV, which is remotely monitored. So in, in that case, we would need broadband for the CCTV, um, so we can also use the broadband for the AMPR side of things. Broadband, sorry, AMPR doesn't really require a huge bandwidth. Um, the amount of data that's flying about is, is fairly minimal. So compared to streaming a camera, it's, it's, it's really very small. So the answer is uh, both, um, AM, uh, both GSM uh, routers and, uh, and, and broadband. Yeah, I think the point the point here is we've all moved to AMPR at the edge. Uh, so if you were bringing all the cameras back to a central PC somewhere, then yes, you would need some sort of fiber or broadband. But if you're if you're doing it at the edge, which you were talking about here with intelligent cameras and and all the data is being packaged together, and all you're doing is sending a, an event a read, which could be you know a, a, a down to about a 30k packet if you need it to be, or even less. Um, or about 300k if you want the full high definition images, so low bandwidth. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Nick and Lawson on that one. Um, Peter Dowling, I've got one here for you. Um, is there any thoughts on implementing compliance reports, uh, report modules into the back offices? Uh, this would give a single place for operators to view compliancy uh, with new code, particularly with the surveillance cameras co surveillance camera code of practice in mind. Having a single place for compliancy documents, uh, documents and a checklist would certainly be of benefit. Thanks, Wes. Um, I think that's a great question and a, re a really good requirement. However, I think that probably be better answered uh, by Zach Park, uh, James. Um, 
yeah, my product owner is probably going to throttle me when I come out of here and start promising all these things. Um, but obviously a part of the new code, this is going to be one of them, again, that needs to be reviewed by us and the ability to kind of record this information in line with the new practice. So um, again, it's, it, I can't really say when, and I don't want to get myself into trouble, um, but it's certainly something that we are going to need to review um, and allow the ability for the operators to have those reporting modules um, in time for when the practice does come into come into place um, fully. So yeah, uh, that's as much information as I can give on this piece. Um, yeah, it's things to come basically, things to come. Okay, um, uh, one for Lawson and Steve again. With regards to the mobile phone solution, do you see these replacing the camera solutions, uh, especially as potentially a cheaper cost of ownership? No. <laughs> the quick answer the uh the uh, steve, steve will confirm this the uh we've done a lot of testing with um mobile phones they are very good and the process of speed well, one thing we did during lockdown is double the speed of our engine twice and a spin-off is uh, a lot of the the um processes in mobile phones are the same as you see in in in, in the devices we're talking about sort of um and, and so we can achieve very very fast recognition but it all comes from images garbage in garbage out and often on the cheaper phones you can't control the shutter speed etc um, but if you if you've got a good image then it'll work so we say yes use it in conjunction with the fixed systems have the fixed systems at your car parks but use the mobiles for spot checks traffic wardens that sort of thing so just just, just seeing what's going on yeah totally agree with that and um, you know it's a great way to utilize the camera on a, a phone through a, a, an app on the phone to pre-populate accurate information into forms that are being generated and printed out. So it, it can be used in that way very, very sensibly. But it, it relies on someone pointing it in the right direction at the right time, knowing exactly where it's pointed. Are, are, are they inside the car park but pointing at a vehicle on the road? You know, you get into all sorts of compliance issues when you just give people something they can walk around to any old location and point a camera. Um, Steve, there's one that's come through here now. Um, I'm not sure if you're the right person for it, but uh, is there any way that the camera, uh, the cameras, or maybe James, you could also answer, is that part could automatically black out people's faces? Uh, at the moment, it, there is no ability to obviously automatically do that. Um, I know there have been talks around the offices here about potentially an AI that kind of picks up those um, faces and brands and things like that. Um, at the moment, like I said, there's nothing that allows that automatically, but there is an obfuscate tool where you can obviously block those out, but it is a manual process. Again, as far as uh, whether it's being implemented, I can't tell you that's going to be something down to our product owner. Um, I do appreciate a lot of these questions coming through are about features that are potentially missing from the Zappark system. Um, I know that soon we are going to be engaging in a client panel where we obviously speak with our clients and uh, basically get the feedback of what you're expecting from the new code of practice. So what is missing from the system? What would you ideally like to see? Um, what would you like you know, to get us to build into it in order for you to abide by the new practice? So yeah, at the moment, um, it is just kind of a manual process of, of, of scale that's a really hard word, um, but for skating faces and brands um, manually from the AMPR checker. I think we've lost words. I think we may have. And just add, add a bit to that. We've been doing work in Saudi Arabia where uh, we've been um, <clears throat> using a, a, a a twin lens solution actually two cameras next to each other one to, to read the number plate and one with uh, additional filters um, to, to, to look through the windows windscreen so that you can see the driver um, mm -hmm. and what uh, what we working with some analytics companies that are actually doing analysis of whether they're holding a mobile phone or whether they're wearing a seat belt so it's like it's like the opposite of that you know that, that's using AI to detect them so yeah. you, it, the answer is yes, you would be able to remove faces using sort of, you know, we just because we capture the that image or a higher res version of that image in, in, in these cameras, we can send it off for parallel processing. And so, yes, that's possible. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Marion, I have seen that you've put in when the client panel will be held. Um, I think we are just finalizing some things our end. 
um, and all of our clients will be able to uh, um, have notification of that pretty soon. Um, and obviously, whoever is, is required to attend can join up to the, uh, the panel itself. So I can't give you a date right now, but you should hear from us pretty soon. First of all, I'd just like to say, I'm afraid we've lost our chair. There's been a few technical hurdles at that end. But just to, as a means of wrapping up, um, I would just like to thank all of our panelists today um, for your attendance and for some really um, good issues that you brought up. We will be, um, this recording will be available on our Lander Links YouTube channel for those who couldn't attend and also for those who joined late who'd like to see it again. But um, without further ado, I'd like to thank all our panelists for today. And if no one has anything further to add, we can wrap up.